Welcome to the Google Cloud Platform Cloud Security Fundamentals. In this course, we'll be covering Google Cloud Platform security basics such as organizations, identity and access management. We'll be discussing identity and access management roles and membership. We'll discuss service accounts and how they play into your application services both on-prem and in Google Cloud. We'll discuss Google security best practices for enterprises as well. We'll then proceed on and discuss how G Suite can play an important role in your enterprise cloud security posture. We'll then discuss what a virtual private cloud is and how you can enable features and functions of the VPC, such as a firewall, to enable your security posture as well with Google Cloud. We'll then discuss how compute falls into this and discuss how to access a virtual machine. We'll also provide a demo on that as well. We'll then talk about what a bastion host is and also what a NAT host is as well. We'll then wrap up the course with talking about Stackdriver and how to, to go ahead and create alerts with your services in GCP. Lastly, we'll provide resources around how to find out more about Google Cloud Security and get practice through either Code Labs or Quick Labs. We have a lot to cover, so let's get started. Welcome to the GCP Cloud Security Fundamentals course. Let's go ahead and get started talking about what the course is all about. This course, we're going to be focused on GCP Cloud Security best practices. We're going to be talking about networking and cloud security, how they work together, talk about security features of Google Cloud, and then we'll proceed and talk about designing a cloud service that is secure. And then we'll wrap it up and talk about GCP cloud certifications. Now, this course was really designed for IT professionals that are already proficient in GCP. It's not really meant to be a one-on-one course. The course is really designed to focus mainly on IT security. So if you have an IT security background, then that would be extremely helpful. So if you know what a DDoS attack is, or you know what a CSS issue is, that's great. If you know um, other security uh, challenges like firewalls and uh, areas like that, this will be very helpful. The course is not really meant to be a tutorial, but is more or less going to highlight the features of Google Cloud. We'll also be pointing you to additional resources and consider the course more of a stepping stone to learn about more advanced GCP uh, resources and tools and uh, also uh, services for that matter. Now this course, uh, even though it's focused on security, the course is not designed to be a certification prep course. There is a GCP cloud security course. Um, that is uh, more uh, directed towards passing the GCP Cloud Security course. So let's go ahead and get started and um, get working on GCP Cloud Security. Let's go ahead and talk about organizational hierarchy and what projects are. Now, in uh, this course, we're, we're going to focus mainly on um, how projects and organizations uh, folders and, and resources all play in into Google Cloud, but we want to focus mainly on some of the security uh, capabilities or best practices around managing these. So first of all, when we think of um, an organizational uh, unit, um, things are done a little bit differently in Google than the way you would handle things, for example, in AWS. Now, in Google, you're going to go ahead and create an account and then provision resources from the project. Now, in AWS, you basically create your OU, which is an org unit, and then you create sub-accounts from that. So basically, the first thing to point out here is that GCP and AWS do things a little differently. One of the, the big deals with Google Cloud I'd like to just point out 
is that uh, you have the ability to tie in G Suite or another Gmail account and also Cloud Identity as well now, which is an identity as a service um, platform that can be used. But uh, with GCP, you can go ahead and add a Google user or a group to your organization, your folder, or your project. And then they will get access to everything under that. So generally, Google's best practices when adding multiple users is to create a group. Now, in G Suite, we have um, basically what is called a super admin. This is known as an organizational admin. When we talk about projects in Google Cloud, we just want to realize that the project's main goal is to essentially facilitate organization of services and also to segment um, for, for billing and uh, utilization as well. Now, each GCP platform project has a project name, a project ID, and a project number. Now, the main thing to realize here is that the project ID is known as the app ID. This is probably where you're going to focus most of your time because you're going to want to ensure that the right permissions are tied to the project ID and the users that are using that project as well. So we'll go ahead and talk more about that when we create a service account, for example. So you want to use a project to track resources and quota usage. You want to enable billing, uh, manage permissions and credentials. So when you create a project, remember, you don't have to create a user um, that's going to have access to every project and every resource. You want to be able to get granular. And that's the beauty of Google Cloud. It allows you to do that. So you get as granular or as um, open as you like. You can enable services and APIs as well. And here's an example of uh, how uh, the project uh, would be set up. And um, you have a project name, project ID, and a project number. Now, folders. This is new to um, Google Cloud as compared to projects. It's, you know, again, only been like a year and a half or so. But it's part of cloud identity and access management. With Cloud IAM folders, you can go ahead and um, assign policies to resources at a granularity that you so choose. So, for example, if you deploy cloud storage, um, you can go ahead and deploy, for example, a policy that is going to specify who can access that resource when and how and from where. So you have a lot of flexibility in how resources are handled. And for those that are AWS uh, knowledgeable, this is very similar to AWS directory services. Now there's a hierarchy in Google that uh, is really uh, important to appreciate. Now generally when you deploy a GCP project, you're going to deploy a project with resources that are under it. And then um, if you so choose, you could deploy an organization and then also add folders if you use an IAM appropriately. But basically, you could have basically the organization basically manage all your projects, your folders, and your resources as well. Remember, that's the organizational unit that you could go ahead and create. And here's an example of how you create a project. And you can see that those project APIs are tied to the services. And then you have an organizational project that is going to use over here, Compute Engine. When it comes to the, the hierarchy, an organizational resource is available for G Suite and Cloud Identity customers. So once again, um, it's very simple. You have the ability to create a cloud identity um, ID as a service account if you want. You link it to your org domain. And then think of the organization as the top level of the hierarchy. And then you set controls and your config settings as well. And this allows you to manage your billing, your projects. And what's really nice is if you tie it into the organization, this allows you to create a life cycle. And if you're already using G Suite, you already are familiar um, with how to handle things. So for example, if an employee leaves, generally what happens is HR will send an email to the email administrator. 
Well, that's great. However, what about if they had a cloud account? How do you handle that? Or what about if they had resources? How do you know to maintain it for compliance purposes? What about deleting the resources that the employee was using? Do you need that or not? Now, GCP accounts can be associated to a G Suite domain or Gmail user account. We already know that. And again, if we want to follow lifecycle, we want to do that appropriately. Now, when we deploy a GCP project, the APIs are going to be considered uh, part of the project. And so therefore, if you have two projects, you're going to be deploying the APIs for those resources individually. So you're not going to have a an API that's Google Cloud wide or anything. Now some of the resources are going to be global, regional, and zonal. Now with G Suite, now with G Suite, we want to go ahead and allow outside users. We could do that. We just simply add their Gmail or their G Suite account. We could also add a G Suite domain and then um, have the G Suite administrator or the organizational administrator basically become the um, the administrator essentially of not only the organization but also all the projects that are in that organization and we could uh, basically also address chargeback by doing this could also create separate billing accounts or have the same billing account for all the projects now quoters um, in GCP are managed basically by the project. And so you may have in one project um, 10 instances of Compute Engine and none in the other. And so you could exceed your quotas for certain resources um, just by uh, not even realizing it. So you want to check your quotas to see um, what is deployed and what's available. And also know that there's different quotas for free accounts and different quotas for paid accounts. If you do need to increase your quota, you simply request uh, that to Google support and they'll increase it if it's uh, if it's uh, going to be appropriate. OK, so I'm over here at a whiteboard app and I want to talk about how um, orgs, folders and projects and resources all come together here. Now, one of the things to point out is if we wanted to, let's say we're using G Suite or um, Cloud identity. And again, just very quickly, just to show you. So if we're using that, we have the ability to create an organization. So let's say I want to go ahead and call this company A.com. And company A.com is going to have um, projects, and they have three projects. So let's go ahead and get my little pen here and draw this out. So they have uh, three projects we have dev, we have QA, and we have prod. Now, generally what we want to do is, of course, have different resources under each project. And because we have resources under each project, we've essentially already created a security posture by sandboxing each of these projects with the resources. Now, one of the things to realize is that if we want, we go in a course and... Um, could take these projects and essentially peer them together if we so choose. So we create a pipeline, um, but maybe we don't want to do that. But let's just say, for example, here we have our resources and um, we want to make sure dev doesn't, you know, touch resources that are part of production, right? Now, right now, let's say we have dev, QA, and prod, and um, they have a separate billing. So Maybe we don't want separate billing. Maybe we want to have control and um, put, you know, the billing under uh, one organization. So what we would do is go up here and um, enable an organization if we, we if we have G Suite. So this will allow us to um, have a life cycle. This will allow us to control. Um, billing, manage users, and various other uh, features and functions as well. So if we go back here, 
CompanyA.com, we would have what's called an organizational administrator. And this org admin could manage all the projects under that. Now, let's say, for example, we're using Cloud IAM and I want to create folders. And each of these folders will have very granular access to, let's say, a cloud storage object or some kind of um, other resource that we want to set up, right? Does, doesn't matter per se. But anyway, so we want to we want to maintain additional um, control. So for example, maybe we want to have the app engine administrator, let's say. Let's go ahead and get my text up. So if we have our app engine admin, he has access to the folders. However, our compute engine admin um, does not. So again, that's just one way we go ahead and get granular. So this guy does not, but this person does. So this allows us to get really granular um, in our management of our resources on Google Cloud. So I hope that sum, sums that up. So just remember an organization is a top level domain. A folder is going to be a subset of Cloud IAM and allows us to essentially um, get granular in our resource management down to um, the lowest level possible. And then remember our projects are going to be sandboxes of our resources. And resources are going to be under each of the projects. And if we want to go ahead and bring the projects together, we have ways to do that or we just leave them separate. All right, so with that said, let's go ahead and move on to the next chapter. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about identity and access management. Now, with identity and access management, you have the ability to grant access to members, and members can be any of the following types. So the first is a Google account, a service account, a Google group, a G Suite domain, or a cloud identity domain. Now, when it comes to the choice of what you do, a couple of things will come into play. For example, do you have an organization? Are you using G Suite or are you not? Are you using Cloud Identity or are you not, right? So these are some of the things to think about. But when we talk about, for example, um, users and groups in Google Cloud Platform, you're going to grant permission to members and the members can use, of course, any type of accounts to access GCP. So for example, a Google account. A service account. Now, a service account is really a non-personal account. It's meant for your machine-to-machine -machine communication. Uh, it's really meant for API calls, basically on behalf of an application. So you're not going to give that out to a user. That's not going to be um, something you want to do. But Google Groups, for example, is a collection of Google accounts and service accounts as well. So if you wanted to grant access, for example, to service accounts for developers to access Cloud Storage or Cloud SQL, then you can do that. Now, G Suite and Cloud Identity. Again, G Suite, we know, um, allows an organization to map their own domain name and also create specific IDs as well. So instead of like using Gmail or another Google account, um, a company can configure a domain such as um, you know, mycompanya.com instead of using a, a Google account, for example. Now, cloud identity users, for example, um, generally you're not going to have access to G Suite, of course, but basically it's useful if you're not using G Suite. So that's something to consider. And then um, when it comes to Active Directory and LDAP, we'll talk about GCDS as well in the course as well. Now, a large number of projects can become wieldy, unwieldy to manage, right? So this is why we want to have an org node if we're running G Suite or Cloud Identity. So we want to set that up if needed. When it comes to org nodes, a couple of things come into play here. We have the ability to use our own authentication. So if we already have our own KMS set up, we continue to use that. We could federate our identities to GCP as well. So if we're using Okta or something, we can do that. 
We could also, uh, for example, um, set controls on how people log in, log in, how many times they fail. Could also revoke access. So, for example, when someone leaves a company, then we have the ability to disable them and also manage the resources they were using and add them as part of a life cycle, for example. And then we have um, what was called Google Apps Directory Sync. It's also uh, really known now uh, as uh, Google Cloud Directory Services, GCDS. Now let's talk about GCDS. So GCDS is really a nice tool for the right situation. So for example, we wanna use GCDS if we're already using um, an org uh, node and we're also using Active Directory or LDAP for management of our authentication, for example. So GCDS does support a hybrid cloud approach as well, which is actually really nice. It's basically, um, think of G GCDS as a secure tool, but it's really a connector that you're going to use for provisioning your users and groups for, for both cloud platform and G Suite. It's going to synchronize, for example, AD or LDAP to Google Cloud Platform. And this will automate pretty much everything that you want by adding, modifying, deleting users, groups, etc. Now, GCDS is going to run in your own network and then uh, basically provide that secure network connection to connect with G Suite. Now, also, to GCDS is pretty much a one way sync. For example, synchronize data from G Suite, from LDAP to G Suite. And then G Suite will, of course, integrate with Google Cloud. So, this is really pretty useful. So, it's a one way update. Let's go ahead and move on to the next module here. Okay, well, let's talk about IAM roles. Now, in identity and access management, we have roles. Now, there's different types of roles. We generally would have primitive, predefined, and custom. Those are the three types. So let's talk about that. Now, the three types, again, primitive, curated, and custom. The main uh, difference is primitive, of course, is the original role. That was like what first came out with GCP. The challenge with primitive roles is that they're very loose. In other words, they're not very granular. And so therefore, it's sort of like you're granting access to all the permissions in the project or all the permissions on App Engine or Cloud SQL. So for example, you may not want to have your App Engine uh, developers, let's say, um, be able to uh, start up more instances than they need or to uh, delete uh, or terminate an instance. So you may want to have um, a viewer, you may want to have a, um, a, a app engine administrator. So there's different roles you can go ahead and customize. Now, when it comes to curated, uh, this is uh, uh, actually sort of uh, uh, a name that sort of, I, I think has sort of changed. It was also known at one time as like predefined, but curated roles are uh, newer roles that give a finer grained access uh, over primitive. So for example, um, App Engine Viewer would be a good one, or Cloud Storage View Access. Custom roles, this is again going to be, this is going to allow you to pick and choose what you want. Okay, now service accounts. So a service account is going to be necessary, uh, of course, for your um, services to be able to communicate from server to server, for example. Compute Engine needs to have a service account, essentially, to be able to go out and pick up um, something on cloud storage or on, um, let's say, Cloud SQL or Bigtable, whatever the, whatever the service you're looking at. So these service accounts are going to authenticate applications that are running on your VMs. Now you have the choice to use um, a, your own key pair or something provided by um, Google. For example, with the encryption key, you have the ability to use a KMS. And um, with KMS, it provides AES-256 standard encryption. Now, it can also integrate with IAM and also 
as part of that provide audit logging which you may want as well and again it allows users for example to manage and monitor um, an individual key now one of the things we'll talk about is key management as well during the course but one of the things to pay attention to is you could deploy the key project wide or you could deploy a key just for that virtual machine it's up to you on how you want to deploy your keys now if you have Google handle it they're gonna rotate the keys daily now as far as service accounts by default all projects come with a compute engine default service account this is of course necessary so that you can do some work initially when you start that new instance uh, for example using G cloud the default service account is enabled on that instance as well and now a service account is going to be uh, looking exactly like that now with app engine for example permissions for example app engine has these different roles so we have App Engine Administrator, App Engine Service Admin, Deployer, Viewer, and Code Viewer. And you could see the difference in access. So for example, you may want to have developers that are only testing to be able to um, deploy code, for example. And um, you may not want to give them admin access. In other words, you don't want them to modify configuration variables, uh, variables for example. They can view it, for example, with Deployer, but they can't modify it. So this is this is where really um, the uh, curated roles really come in, the predefined roles or a custom role. So for example, you could just select one of these or you could pick and choose two or three, whatever makes sense. So for example, if you have auditors coming in, um, you may want to give them um, App Engine Viewer or Code Viewer access, depending on what they're looking at. If they're looking at source code, they're going to have Code Viewer. If they're just looking at the config and settings, then again, you just need to give them um, App Engine Viewer. Now, when we decide to add a user to Google Cloud, there's a uh, essentially a um, workflow to this. Now, one of the things to point out is, again, we need to add a new member. They have to be part of a project there is an account invitation workflow. Now, when you do that, the um, invitation will be sent to the member. You could also add uh, owners to a project using the console as well. However you want, you could use the command line as well. So there is a workflow. There's a link to, to find out more about how this works, but it's fairly straightforward. Just add the user. They get an email invitation. They select the link, and then they get started. Let's go ahead and uh, move on to the next module. Okay, let's talk about service accounts a little bit more in detail um, before we uh, continue on. So the first thing is, is that service accounts from a GCP perspective is, of course, very important. So when we consider service accounts, we just want to be aware um, and again, we covered this earlier, but just realize again, a service account um, is, is a way for you to identify um, your programs to authenticate and gain access to GCP APIs. Now, a service account, again, it's really used in an application that's going to call APIs on behalf of an application that does not have access um, to user information. So this type of application generally would need to prove its own identity. And in reality, um, it doesn't need to have a user to do that. So for example, if your project employs server-to-server -server interactions, such as those like between um, a web app, for example, could be a WordPress app or whatever, and Google Cloud Storage, then what you need to do is have a private key and also a service account credentials. And to generate these credentials, you want to be able to view the email address and public keys you've generated. And to do that, there's a process to uh, set that up. And in the demo, we'll talk more about that. Now, by default, all projects come with Compute Engine default service account. When you start that new instance with G Cloud, it is also enabled as well. And we already know that there's going to be an email anytime you see 
cloudservices.gserviceaccount.com, you know exactly what that is. That is a service account. Now, by default, GCP has, of course, a robust IAM posture. And again, as part of a way to um, grant access, we, we can, of course, grant access very, uh, very differently. So via Google Accounts, Google Groups, G Suite domains, etc. But in this case, let's talk about service accounts. Now, if we want to go ahead and um, basically go ahead and generate credentials or create a service account, we basically can go ahead and set up a new service account, create new credentials, and then add the service account key. Now, one of the things to pay attention to, too, is that the public and private key is going to be typically a standard P12 file, or it could be JSON as well. And you'd load that essentially with the Google API client library. So we'll talk more about that coming up uh, in a few minutes. Now, when it comes to service server interactions, the first thing is we want to go ahead and create that service account for your project in the console, in the API console. Then what we want to do is your application, of course, is going to do what? It's going to prepare to authorize those API calls. And it's going to request this via a token, and it's going to use Open Authentication 2.0. Now, the applications will use, essentially, the token to call the APIs. And again, it's JSON or P12 formats. Some other notes to consider, if you do use like a G Suite Marketplace to install an application for your domain, the permission should be granted to the application automatically. And one of the things is you should not also need to uh, manually authorize the service accounts for that application. That is done generally via the marketplace application. And then you could also delegate domain-wide authority to a service account if you so choose. Now, why you'd want to do that is a little bit beyond me. But again, because remember, it's domain-wide. It's for the whole company. And then some other notes, um, users are going to be authenticated with emails and passwords. However, so again, the difference here is users are differently um, are different because they're authenticated differently. So they're authenticated with email and passwords, whereas service accounts are authenticated with the key file. So your project, of course, needs to have a private key when it's requesting the OAuth to access token. Now, Google does not keep a copy of this private key. And for example, the screen, for example, um, when you're downloading your private key, you have to save that. Um, don't lose that key. That is, a uh, again, a um, P12 file, basically. And you're going to download that to your local machine. Again, um, when you download, it's going to say you're going to have to save it. So just be aware. Don't lose it, because if you do, you're not going to get into that. Now, the download, uh, downloaded private key is going to have essentially the key's thumbprint as it's known. And as part of that, it's going to have like a password, like a not secret. And um, one more thing, too, is that the private keys should be, of course, the same. For example, not a secret is, is sort of the, the term that you might want to use. And each of the keys will be unique, of course. Now, there's more to this, of course, but for, for this course, we're just going to cover this at a high level. And then some common operations. Again, the service account can have edit access, delete, create key, modify roles, etc. Now, uh, the next module is going to be a demo on service accounts, so we'll go ahead and talk more about that before we move on to another subject. Let's go ahead and move on to the demo. Welcome to the Create a Service Account Solution. What we want to do now is go ahead and create a new service account. Now, one of the things to refresh your memory on is the service accounts, you have to pay attention to where you create them. And I'm going to go ahead and create them in uh, the default project that I have called INE Cloud Engineer. But let's go ahead and what we want to do is go to IAM and Admin. And then we want to go over to where it says service accounts. 
As you notice, I have two service accounts and I'd like to create a new one. So what I do is go to create service account. I am going to call this INE service account. I'm going to select a role and we're going to select project and then viewer. We just want this role to be a viewer of the project resources. We don't want it to edit. We don't, we don't want it to delete any resources. It's more like an auditor role. You're going to view and just validate um, the resources there. So a situation like this, you may want to have um, service accounts created for App Engine, let's say, and you want App Engine to go out and validate if uh, those files are in cloud storage or not, let's say. That's why you want to create a service account for a specific service-to-service -service or server-to-server -server, um, account requirements. Therefore, you don't have to create a user account and uh, do anything manually. Now, we could also uh, add another role. So this uh, service account could be more than just a viewer with projects. We could also add it uh, to another um, resource and another role if we so choose as well. In this case here, we're just going to go ahead and uh, not proceed with that. The task was pretty simple. We could also enable uh, a private key if we want. And then if we have G Suite tied into our cloud, we could also enable the domain-wide uh, delegation with G Suite. In this case here, we're just going to go save. As you can see, we went from two service accounts to three service accounts. The service account that we created is INE service account. There's no keys affiliated with it. And that is the email for that service account. We could select that service account. And you can see that it's a member of these services, Compute Engine, Kubernetes, Owner. And again, we go ahead and adjust the permissions if we want. When we select that service account, you can see that uh, this is uh, not enabled. We create a key. We can go back. And again, if we want, I could go and uh, delete that if I want. I could go here to delete that service account. Now, from a security perspective, if you don't need a service account active anymore, you want to delete it. If it's not being utilized, delete it. Because again, if you think about it, that's one more account that could be compromised. The keys could get stolen and uh, you could have a bad weekend. So with that said, we just completed the task of creating a service account to be a project viewer. Let's go ahead and delete that account as well. All right, let's proceed on to the next module. In this module here, let's go ahead and talk about best practices around GCP security. Now, one of the things to be aware of is that there's generally going to be, of course, IT security best practices, such as you know, using, for example, least privilege in your account management and permissioning, ACLs, etc. And then there'll be Google best practices around security as well. So we'll be sort of mixing those in together. And uh, it's really important to understand how they work together. But also, if you do take uh, any of the exams, you'll likely run into some of this content as well. Now, when it comes to IT security best practices, generally the principle least privilege should always come up. Basically, you just want to apply the minimum amount of access that's required. For example, if you have auditors, you don't want to give them, you know, write access. You just want to give them read or view access. Try to use groups if you can as well, and that way, um, you don't have to worry about if you have a hundred different users creating a hundred different uh, user profiles. If you use groups, um, and this is Google's best practice as well, um, to to at least uh, you know make sure that you place your users in a group that makes sense. So if they're if they're auditors, place them in an auditor group. If they're administrators, place them there. Uh, that way, it just makes things a lot easier. Control who can change policies and group memberships. So designate administrators uh, judiciously. Also, audit any policy changes. 
any time you change a policy, audit that. Look at your audit logs as well for permission changes. And also, too, look at any additional levels that are being added. So, for example, if you're adding additional users or permissions or changing anything, uh, definitely review that as well. Now, when it comes to Google's view of the world, generally GCP approaches security um, essentially the, the same way that uh, Google approaches its own security. So, for example, Google's been in the data center business for you know, almost 20 years, and they pretty much have a good idea of what works with IT security. So a lot of Google Cloud Platform's best practices mirrors exactly what they're doing. GCP secures resources by building a security structure according to various layers. So everything's about the stack. When it comes to physical locations of Google servers, generally they're pretty limited and, and also too, they're managed as a critical priority. So Google, again, um, doesn't try to disclose where all their servers are and limits the access to them. GCP ensures communication is secure at the transport layer through TLS connections and also front-end controls to try to prevent DDoS attacks, for example. Now, when it comes to Google's view of the world as well, just realize that Google owns their own network and infrastructure, so it's really um, their uh, structure that they built, and therefore everything is, of course, as secure as possible. One of the things that they do is, of course, encryption in transit and at rest. And there's a chip called the Titan chip. Um, if you're interested in that, you go over to the security white paper. It talks more about that as well. But basically, the Titan chip establishes trust at the hardware root for all the machines and assets in GCP. This adds an additional layer to authenticate hardware uh, handling uh, around your data for that, for that matter. Okay, now a couple of uh, minor things before we uh, wrap up the module. The first is when it comes to personal public key certificates and multi-factor authentication, um, GCP maintains control and keeps a trail of this, and this helps maintain compliance as well. And you always want to review the best practices around enterprise organizations, and the link for this is right here. So let's take a look because there's some really important IAM sections to consider. So I'm over here at the best practices for enterprise organizations. And what you want to do is um, scroll on down and you'll get over to IAM. And um, right over here. So it'll say Identity and Access Management. You can see that they have best practices for Google Identities, Federation, um, migrating on managed accounts, controlling access, using groups and service accounts, and defining a policy. So let's just take a quick look at policies. So one of the things that they're recommending is to use what's called the organizational policy service to get centralized and programmatic control over your cloud resources. Now, basically with Cloud IEM, just realize that a lot of these best practices are already um, built in. And they also provide really good insight into how you could define your policies because one of the challenges that organizations have is they generally don't um, define sort of who can do what, how they can perform this, how this should be set up. So having some kind of uh, policy is very useful. So this policy design um, helps provide a lot of insight into how Google recommends you um, connect to Google Cloud and maintain security. And uh, it's, it's actually pretty detailed and it really gives some good oversight. Um, I would recommend you take a look at it if you're not familiar with it. It also um, gives you descriptions of policies, auditing, how to handle auditing. These are some areas that you really want to take a look at, um, how to handle shared VPCs. So with that said, that's the um, basically the website for enterprise uh, best practices. And go over to the links that they have 
um, a lot of this is actually going to be on the exams, whether it's the architect or the engineer exam or the data engineer exam. A lot of this will be pretty, um, pretty uh, useful for studying as well. Okay, let's go ahead and continue on. And then when it comes to IM best practices, just remember the principle of least privilege, uh, again, is straightforward. Just don't apply permissions that are not needed. So again, if it's an auditor, give them view only, read only, whatever the requirement is. Try not to give them administrator or write or any kind of um, ability to move stuff around. That's really um, the, the main thing to keep in mind here. Let's talk about G Suite and GCDS. Now, as part of your security posture with GCP, if you're using G Suite or Cloud Identity, these are really good tools to consider to, uh, to, to really integrate into your security posture. We're going to go ahead and focus on G Suite, and I'll talk about what GCDS is as well. Um, when it comes to um, Google, one of the things they do really well is they integrate all their services um, as one. And so if you're using G Suite already, you have some additional capabilities to, to take advantage of here. So let's talk about G Suite first of all. So what is G Suite? Well, this is a package of cloud-based services that uh, essentially can provide your company, school, or enterprise, whatever, whatever you're working with. Um, basically a way to collaborate. And again, we know that it has um, social media tools, document uh, collaboration tools, etc. But when you're using G Suite, you can integrate these services with Google Cloud. Now, one of the things to consider is to use GCDS. So this is the G Suite uh, Cloud Directory Sync. So for example, when you add someone to G Suite, you could also ensure that they're added to Google Cloud or removed from Google Cloud. And what's really important is that you could integrate this into your LDAP directory services or MS Active Directory if you're using that as well. And when you use it, for example, the data in your LDAP directory server is never modified or compromised. It's a one-way solution. So basically, it'll update from LDAP to Google Cloud. GCDS is a secure tool. It'll keep track of your users and groups. And this has to be set up by the G Suite admin. And you'll use what's called the GCDS configuration manager to customize your synchronizations, um, et cetera. And you can schedule it. It's fairly straightforward. Now, when it comes to GCDS, the way this works is basically there's a couple steps. The first thing is that's going to happen is that data is going to be exported in a list from your LDAP server and um, or your Active Directory server. And then you set up rules on how the list is generated. So for example, you go in and pick up anyone that has been added in the last 30 days. Whatever the rule you want to go ahead and create, whatever the policy. And then the second thing is GCDS will connect to the Google domain and generate a list of these users, groups, and uh, contacts. Next thing that happens is GCDS will look at the list. So for example, it'll compare list one to list two, and then anything that's changed will be updated, will be synchronized. And then you could also get reports sent to you about what has changed. Now, when it comes to GCDS, the benefits of using it, is that it's going to ensure that your domain data matches your Active, Active Directory data. It also allows you to customize your rules. It is a one-way sync, as, as we already know, but it's basically a utility that you could run in a server environment. And once again, it's not going to modify anything um, outside of your perimeter. It's not going to muck up your LDAP. Uh, again, it, it's meant to sync up your Google services from your LDAP services. Now, some of the benefits, again, is that uh, it includes extensive tests and simulations to ensure that everything's correct. So you have the ability to practice before you actually perform anything. It also has all the components in the installation package. And then it also has features as well to ensure security. Now, with GCDS, 
essentially the current release um, is release 457 as of March 19th, 2018. Now again, this might be a newer release by the time you're viewing the course. Always check, of course. And then as far as domain requirements, you need to have a Google domain. You have to have a Google domain super user account to authorize GCDS. And then you need to have API access to your Google domain as well. And then as far as finding the installation software, getting the requirements, the link is right there. Feel free to take a look. And the download is uh, over at tools.google.com. I'll let you uh, play around with that if you're interested. Now, this is an example of what GCDS looks like. Basically, you have your domain configuration, LDAP, your settings, logging, your sync capabilities. And then uh, again, this is going to use OAuth. You'll need to enter your primary domain if you have it. So if it's companya.com, go ahead and add that. And then um, when it comes to GCDS, again, just remember that nothing modified. It is a secure tool. It's a one-way sync. Now with G Suite, again, you could set up your own organization domain. So if you're using G Suite again, set up your domain. Uh, I assume that's already done if you're using G Suite. But, but again, if you don't, you can go ahead and enable that, set that up. You could enable, um, for example, G Suite Lifecycle Management, DLP, KMS, a lot of uh, great tools. Now, one thing to note, if you're not using G Suite, you could use Cloud Identity. Now, Cloud Identity is going to enable user management which is pretty much what you're going to do in G Suite. Um, and um, again, it, it doesn't have all the features and functions of G Suite, but it'll at least act as a um, sort of identity management service on your behalf. Um, and, and this really enables customers to uh, extend out their services without having to use G Suite. And then uh, as far as GCDS, we know that uh, it, it's really uh, meant to integrate. It supports LDAP. Um, and then the main thing is to leverage identities that are housed on on-prem so that Google Cloud can connect with them with other Google apps. So basically, it's all about connecting your on-prem to your G Suite and then G Suite to your Google Cloud services. And again, a lot more features there. I would encourage you to go ahead and look at the documents for GCDS to find out more. Okay, welcome back. What I'd like to do is just sum up some of the concepts we talked about in a whiteboard discussion and just make sure that we have a good grasp of some of these concepts and how they play into security with Google Cloud Platform. Now, the first thing we want to talk about is generally when we deploy a Google Cloud project, we're going to deploy a project or projects. So for example, we get our account, we sign up, we deploy our project or our projects, whatever, whatever the scenario is. And then what will happen after we deploy our projects, we then will deploy um, or add our resources essentially to um, to our projects. However, let's say we're using G Suite and we're using Cloud IAM. We have some options here. So what we could do, instead of each project managing their own resources and billing, we could control each of these projects and in introduce what's called a life cycle via what's called an organization. So if we have a top level domain in G Suite, let's say it's company a.com, the admin for that organization could manage each of these projects or they could also decide, you know what, maybe we don't want to manage everything down to the last detail. We're going to have project owners manage um, each of these. So again, we can we can handle this a couple different ways. Now, what about if we're not particularly sure that the granularity 
of roles and um, membership and groups and everything sort of makes sense to us. What about if we decide, you know what, maybe we want to deploy folders for specific resources and really just say only this person can access this from this specific point. And this will give, and, and also too, they can only like deploy App Engine. They can't uh, modify or upload code or anything. So this is a way we could induce folders as part of that. So in a nutshell, there's a lot of really concise security features that could be thrown in here when we look at G Suite, for example, and Cloud IAM. Now, if we do go the route of G Suite, we have the ability as well to also induce a lifecycle. And the way we'd want to do that is through this tool called GCDS. So GCDS will sync up, for example, our on-prem services to G Suite, which then in turn would sync up LDAP, of course, on-prem, and then push everything out to Google Cloud and G Suite. So we have, we have a lot of flexibility here. Uh, with that said, that's about all that I had for the summary here. Let's go ahead and move on to the next section. Okay, welcome back. What I'd like to do is just sum up some of the concepts we talked about in a whiteboard discussion and just make sure that we have a good grasp of some of these concepts and how they play into security with Google Cloud Platform. Now, the first thing we want to talk about is generally when we deploy a Google Cloud project, we're going to deploy a project or projects. So, for example, we get our account, we sign up, we deploy our project or our projects, whatever, whatever the scenario is. And then what will happen after we deploy our projects, we then will deploy um, or add our resources essentially to, um, to our projects. However, let's say we're using G Suite and we're using Cloud IAM. We have some options here. So what we could do instead of each project managing their own resources and billing, we could control each of these projects and in, introduce what's called a life cycle via what's called an organization. So if we have a top level domain in G Suite, let's say it's company A.com, the admin for that organization could manage each of these projects or they could also decide, you know what, maybe we don't want to manage everything down to the last detail. We're going to have project owners manage um, each of these. So again, we can we can handle this a couple different ways. Now, what about if we're not particularly sure that the granularity of roles and um, membership and groups and everything sort of makes sense to us? What about if we decide, you know what, maybe we want to deploy folders for specific resources and really just say only this person can access this from this specific point. And this will give, and, and also too, they can only like deploy App Engine. They can't uh, modify or upload code or anything. So this is a way we could induce folders as part of that. So in a nutshell, there's a lot of really concise security features that could be thrown in here when we look at G Suite, for example, and Cloud IAM. Now, if we do go the route of G Suite, we have the ability as well to also induce a lifecycle. And the way we'd want to do that is through this tool called GCDS. So GCDS will sync up, for example, our on-prem services to G Suite, which then in turn would sync up LDAP, of course, on-prem, and then push everything out to Google Cloud and G Suite. 
So we have we have a lot of flexibility here. Uh, with that said, that's about all that I had for the summary here. Let's go ahead and move on to the next section. All right, let's talk about what a VPC is. That is a virtual private cloud. Now, as you would expect, a virtual private cloud is actually a very important um, part of the Google Cloud infrastructure. And it plays a, a lot of really critical, uh, basically, uh, moving pieces in a typical cloud architecture. And we'll talk about how all that works. Now, there's uh, different uh, modes, and there's also the ability to peer other VPCs. And we'll talk about the use cases for that as well. So a virtual private cloud, we want to think of this as a, a global, private, isolated network partition. Another way to look at it is essentially a sandbox. This is a sandbox of resources that, that is global. So for example, when we create a VPC, we're essentially creating a network structure that spans Google's global enterprise um, data center structure. So therefore, you're going to have a subnet for each of the different uh, zones that you're going, or regions, I should say, that you're going to be connecting to. And as part of that, you have the ability to use resources um, in Iowa and still be able to connect to resources in Finland without actually leaving Google Cloud. So basically, it's on Google's network. So very powerful solution here. Let's talk about how this is different. Now, this is a global communication space. It goes through Google's backbone directly. This is a big deal in the sense that um, this is different. So again, you may or may not see my mouse very well, but um, you can see that the traditional structure, if you're using another competitor, if you want to go from US West to US East, you generally had to leave the cloud data center to go to the other cloud data center. And you wouldn't go over the competitor's network. You would have to go through the internet. Now with Google's VPC, you're basically going on Google's well-provisioned network without actually leaving Google's network. So therefore, you're not actually traversing the internet. So this is, this is a big deal. And uh, the performance and the security benefits is, is pretty far and wide. So compare this to a sandbox of worldwide resources. Now, a VPC is going to support your enterprise by providing you a global communication space. It allows you to use computer other services in a protected environment. It allows you to use these services on a worldwide scale or as local as you want. It's up to you. You could also share your VPC. So for, therefore, if you create two VPCs or you want to connect up another VPC, you can do that through what's called a shared VPC. There's some limits on that. And we'll talk about that um, as well. But basically, uh, there is hybrid support as well. You could private peer uh, as well. And there's two types. There's auto and custom. And in the demo, we'll talk more about these options. Some of the features, again, um, the main thing to, to point out here is that it goes through Google's backbone directly. This is, again, the big differentiator between other clouds. Now, there's different uh, modes for VPCs. We have auto mode and we have custom mode. Now, auto mode is perfectly fine if you want to deploy something really quickly. It's going to use a predefined IP range. And you don't have to worry about your own CEDAR range and having to set up all your subnets. Now, again, custom mode is manual, auto is, is automatic. You're just basically letting Google handle it for you. Now, again, if you're going to keep this VPC up and have uh, applications running production, you want to have some kind of customization, I'm sure. So the use case for each of these could be very different. Now, with VPC peering, what you can do is um, add, essentially, a virtual private cloud by peering them. Basically, it creates what's called uh, RSC 1918 connectivity. And it allows you to peer that um, between networks. So for example, let's say company A buys company B. Use cases for peering are generally going to be when organizations with different network admin domains 
uh, need to work together or basically organizations that want to peer with other organizations. So generally, one of the things I typically see is generally you'll have cloud services that'll get created and they'll be on different silos. And then over time, when the organization grows, they'll want to bring everything together. And the no most non-disruptive way is to peer them together instead of having to, to migrate or, or anything of that nature. Now, again, the VPC highlights, uh, again, we already know that uh, when we create a VPC, we could have one or more uh, VPC networks uh, in, in a project. So when we create a project, we could have several VPCs, right? Now, each of the VPC networks is going to be what? It's a global, uh, global network. It's going to span every region. Lastly, the global VPC network allows your instances and resources to communicate with each other over an internal private IP address. Now, this is again a big deal because you're not traversing um, your internet provider or, or the internet, right? When it comes to peering, Google Cloud Platform, again, is going to peer with RFC 1918 protocol. And in the diagram here, you can see that, for example, you have a project and you have your two different networks. And then the use cases, again, for this uh, is, is, again, really meant uh, to bring together organizations that uh, need to work together. So each GCP project contains one or more VPC networks. And we know that each VPC network is a global entity, and it's going to span all the regions. At the current time of writing, there's 20 GCP regions. Now, this global VPC network allows your instances to communicate over a private internal network, essentially, which is Google's. Let's go ahead and move on. In this solution here, we want to go ahead and proceed and create a VPC. So we could do this a few different ways. I could type VPC here and go to VPC network, or we could go over here to network and select VPC network as well. Now, as you can see, I have the default network set up. I want to go create another VPC network. And in this case here, I'm going to call this uh, uh, INE. Let's go ahead and just call it uh, Uh, I'm just going to call this VPC Network 1 um, for now. And I'm going to go ahead and select Auto Mode. And you can see that uh, when it's giving you this warning, and what it's saying is that it's going to automatically assign the IP range structure to each of these regions. And then down here, I could then select the firewall rules. And in this case, uh, the task was asking for TCP 22. We're going to select that, and we want to leave it as regional. Then I just go create. Now, it'll take a few minutes to create the VPC, so we'll come back to that in a second. Now that's been completed, let's go back to the subnet so you can see that's there. Now we want to go delete the VPC. Now it says deleting the VPC and all the networks and routes and firewalls, you can't undo it. Just delete it, we knew that. And it'll go ahead and delete the VPC. You'll see the uh, progress uh, complete here. And that'll take a minute, we'll go back and check. And now that has been deleted. We go validate notifications, and it just completed. So what we've done is we created a VPC network. We added a firewall rule to the VPC network. And then what we did as well is once we created it, we wanted to make sure we deleted it after because, again, having additional networking um, Configs up and running when they're not being used uh, could be a security uh, concern. We also learned that we could turn on and off flow logs, allow Google access, and we could also um, edit 
AVPC if we so choose as well. With that said, let's proceed on to the next module. Let's talk about virtual networking in GCP, and we're going to really focus mainly on the security aspects, of course. So let's go ahead and talk about some of the areas we want to just be aware of. So let's talk about VPNs. We're going to talk about peering, virtual networking, routing, subnetting, IP addressing, and DNS. Now, when it comes to virtual private networks, we want to just be aware that Google has a service called Cloud VPN. Now, Cloud VPN is essentially a managed service that allows you to connect your on-prem to Google Cloud. Now, it's going to be a gateway to gateway solution, and it needs to support RFC 1918, I believe, as well. And just be aware that there's, of course, some strict limitations in support of this. However, this will allow you to ensure that you have an IPsec connection that's fully encrypted. It'll encrypt um, at uh, your end and then de-encrypt at Google's end. Now, when it comes to Cloud VPN, uh, it is a managed service. We just spoke about that, but just be aware there is an SLA with it. It's 99.9 percent. .9%. It is a site-to-site -site VPN, and it can also support dynamic routes or static routes. It's up to you. There's, of course, limitations, and you would want to use Cloud Router uh, if that's the case, if you're going to use, for example, uh, static routes. Supports IKE v1 and v2, and it uses ESP and tunnel mode as well. So you can see in the picture here, you have your uh, server, your uh, VPN on site, connecting to Google Cloud, which is uh, using a VPN gateway, essentially. Now, when it comes to Cloud VPN, there's three different routing methods. And you'll want to really get a grasp of these from a networking perspective. Um, generally, you, you may want to use dynamic BGP in some cases, or policy-based or rope-based. Again, if you have specific uh, network requirements and you want to make sure your traffic goes over a certain path, or void hops or whatever, use essentially rope-based. Policy-based will basically say if traffic comes from point A to point B, um, go ahead and perform, uh, you know, basically route it here or route it there. Uh, dynamic is, again, um, going to react based on traffic requirements and policies. Now, networks, uh, again, in Google are going to isolate systems. So when you go ahead and you create a VPC, as part of that, you're going to have your subnets. Now, these subnets, again, you create a network structure however you want. Um, it is not a physical network structure. It's virtual, of course. And the network does not have a top-level IP range as well. Now, bandwidth does not depend on the location as well, so that's also a huge benefit. Now, one of the things to point out is when you create a network, you can't change the type after you create it. So if it's a, an auto or a custom, you need to pay attention to what you're doing. And uh, just, just make sure that you understand um, what exactly you need before you go create your networks. And again, this is really, again, the main purpose is to, to help you isolate your traffic. This is a good way to um, create basically isolation inside of isolation. So, for example, you create a VPC, uh, create a project, and then in that project you have a, a specific network. This is a really good way to mitigate any kind of issues if, if needed. Now, subnets. Now, you're limited to essentially 100 subnets per project. However, you can, of course, devise these however they want, um, you know, create them in whatever manner. It's up to you. Uh, but basically, we know that subnets do what? They allow us to isolate our resources. So if we're going to deploy VMs, um, and those VMs are in a certain subnet, they're probably going to be grouped together for a reason. And this is also important to know if we want to create, for example, consistency groups or something. Also, too, firewall rules we can apply 
to uh, to a single VM or all the VMs. It's up to, to us to, to deal with this as well. Now there's two options. We have auto and custom. Essentially auto is exactly what it sounds like. It's going to go ahead and give you that uh, predetermined IP range so you get started and get to work. Custom is where you're going to have to know your own CETA range you want to use and um, create your network structure based on that. Now, when it comes to uh, subnets as well, one quick example is that uh, if you want to keep your instances and in testing and in production separate, um, basically, you know, ensure they don't talk to each other, just put them in different networks. It's really that simple. Now, when it comes to instances, again, if they're in different networks, um, again, you can have overlapping address ranges if possible. Um, you may need to create a communication space to be able to communicate uh, as well. So again, you may need to have an external IP if that's what you want to do. Now, when it comes to internal and external IPs, um, one, uh, one quick note uh, just to, to go back quickly. Uh, basically, internal IPs are going to be provisioned by DHCP. And the external IPs are going to be provisioned from a pool. So there's a reserve pool and a static pool as well, uh, and then ephemeral uh, as well. So ephemeral is going to be just a group of IPs that will, you know, again, they're not going to be static. They could change over time. Uh, reserved is going to be stacked. Now, there's a cost, of course, for that. You'll want to understand the cost. And there's good reason to have an external IP that's static, uh, especially if you want to connect directly to on-prem and don't want to uh, have to deal with the application issues because of uh, an IP change or something of that nature. Now, the internal IPs are going to be referencing essentially the, um, the name of the VM, the uh, project, and then it'll also, again, reference the DHCP address as well. Now, one of the things, too, to point out with uh, IP mapping, you can see that there's an internal IP and an external IP. You can connect to the external IP by simply going connect, or just go ahead and use your uh, G Cloud, your SDK kit if you want as well, to connect. And then DNS. Now, when it comes to DNS resolution for internal IPs, um, one of the things just to pay attention to is that the FQDN is going to be a combination of the host name, the project ID, dot internal, and whatever that internal IP is. Everything's handled by the DNS resolver. And then as far as DNS records, uh, you have the power when you're using cloud DNS to handle your DNS records however you want. Now, the administrator can publish these records pointing to an instance if they so choose. Also, too, just note that these records are not published automatically. You have to publish them manually. This gives you the control that you want uh, for privacy purposes, etc. And again, you have the ability to create zones, configure domains, etc. as needed. Now, when it comes to um, virtual networking, just a quick review. We know that each VPC network consists of one or more IP range partitions, and we would call these what? We call these subnetworks or subnets. And we know that each subnet is going to be associated with a region. Networks can also contain one or more subnets within a given region as well. Auto mode will create subnets in each region automatically. And then if we want to use custom mode, we go ahead and start with no subnets and then create each individual region as needed. Let's go ahead and move on. Let's talk about cloud identity and also single sign-on and federation as well. Now, when, when we consider Google Cloud, uh, it's really important to understand some of the capabilities that are available um, with Google Cloud. Now, we talked about G Suite earlier, but we do want to talk about some other options such as Cloud Identity, which is also a great solution um, in some cases for the for the right use case. So let's talk about 
cloud identity and SSO. Now, what is single sign-on? Well, single sign-on allows your users to essentially access, you know, whatever number of applications um, that you're going to allow them without having to sign on um, each time to each uh, platform or each uh, project or vice versa. SAML is commonly used, and um, you could certainly use this with your Google account credentials um, as well. With IAM, the service provides administrators with a single place to manage all your users and cloud apps. The IAM service as well provides users with a unified sign-on access to all their enterprise cloud apps as well. Now, when it comes to cloud identity, if you want to configure cloud identity, you can certainly do that. There's going to be a few things to keep in mind, and um, you want to understand where cloud identity fits in. So, for example, if um, you want to configure cloud identity and manage your users and groups, um, then you'll want to decide on a subscription model because there's two models. There's a free and then there's a, a paid version as well. When you migrate users to cloud identity, you can manage everything um, and manage the access for that matter and compliance across all users in your domain. Now there's uh, free identity services that don't need to have like uh, enterprise level services or Gmail services. Um, but again, it's up to you on what you really need. So, for example, if you really need to have like um, lifecycle management or mobile wipe capabilities, then you'll need to go with the enterprise solution. So basically, the premium edition is the enterprise solution and the free edition um, is, is, again, going to have less robust features. To find out more, to compare the versions, let's go take a look. So on this page here, we have the cloud identity features and additions. So as you see, the green is a premium, uh, the left is a premium with the green check marks. The free um, has you know, a good amount of green and red as well. So a lot of the, the difference is really going to come down to what you need for your environment. A lot of the good use cases for um, using this is, is again going to be for user management. But if you need to have any kind of enterprise level compliance or password um, enforcement, you may want to look at the premium version. Also, too, there's better support for mobile um, device management as well with the premium. So let's go back to the PowerPoint. Now, with SAML, one of the things to, to point out with SSO, um, you have the ability to um, use your Google account credentials to sign on to enterprise applications via single sign-on. So if you want to integrate um, some of your enterprise apps into your Google account services, uh, your credentials, that can certainly be done, and SAML would be the solution to consider. So let's go ahead and move on. Now, I'm over here in the Google Cloud Platform Home Dashboard. What I want to do now is I want to go to Compute Engine. I have a few options to do the same thing. I go up here and type in Compute Engine. And you can see it's right there. I could go over here to the dashboard as well and select Compute Engine Dashboard. Or I could go over here and select Compute Engine as well. Either way, I'll get to the same place. What I'd like to do now is let's go ahead and look at this virtual machine instance. And let's look at the firewall configuration. Now, you could see that um, when I scroll down, you could see that the network tags are for HTTPS. I have the firewall selected. You could see there allow HTTPS traffic as well. I could go over here and I could edit the VM if I like. When I go down there, I could go ahead, enable or disable HTTP. 
I could add additional tags or delete them if I like as well. Now, when I go over here, I could also enable SSH keys or not. I, if I have any keys, I can go ahead and add them. If I don't, I'm going to leave that blank, uh, of course, more than likely. The service account. Now, remember the service account. That's going to be for your application uh, related server to server um, accounts. It's not a user account or anything. I could then go over and um, let's say I want to um, allow HTTP instead of HTTPS. I could do that. In this case, I'm going to leave it to allow and take away the HTTP. And then if I scroll down, I could uh, then um, save that. And it'll go ahead and update uh, this uh, instance. Now, now that the VM's updated, what we just did was just basically enable, uh, actually disable HTTP. That's, that's based on the VM level. However, we want to go and look at the VPC firewall rules now. This is important to do because this is where we're going to really enable um, the different ports and protocols. So to do that, there's a couple different ways to do it. The simplest way, to be honest, is just to go up here and type firewall. And you can see it pops up uh, anything with firewall in it. You can see the firewall rules right there. That's the VPC network. And there's also firewall rules you could set for App Engine as well. But I did want to point out, since we're looking at this, you also have other appliances that you could deploy if you'd like on that VM. Like, for example, Palo Alto Networks, Checkpoint, Pulse, Have Options, and then uh, Qualsys as well. So if you want to go ahead and deploy something from the marketplace, that shopping cart is a marketplace, you can go ahead and do that as well. But in this case here, what we want to do is just go to Firewall Rules. And this will bring us over to the VPC. Uh, the, the project that we're in is INE Cloud Engineer, and that's where we want to be. This is the network. Let's go over here first, look at the VPC networks. You can see that there is just one VPC deployed in this project. Now, when I deploy another VPC, if I so choose, I could go down here and um, enable a new VPC. I could go ahead and create it. And I could also, um, of course, uh, configure uh, some other variables like the firewall rules if I like as well. Now, when I go down here to the firewall rules, let's just look at these for a second. Now, as we remember for the compute options, it supports essentially TCP, ICMP, right? And you have the ability for UDP as well. Now, when it comes to firewall rules, the rules are going to control the incoming or outgoing. From how you handle this, it's very important to understand that the firewall rule is going to be deployed based on the network that you have. In this case, I only have one network. And that's the default network. So if I select the default network, you could see that these are the default networks. This is the region. This is the range, right? And then the subnets. So I go over here and, you know, adjust that if I like. But I'm going to go back. What I want to do now is let's go ahead and select one of these rules and take a quick look at it. So this is ingress. TCP 80. What is 80? That's going to be HTTP, right? That's going to be HTTP protocol. Now, do I want to allow HTTP traffic uh, into this specific network? That's up to me to decide whether or not I do. Um, you'll need to think about that uh, on how that is handled. If I go over here and I select that, Right, I could go over and delete that firewall rule if I want. So if I delete it, it's going to say, do I want to delete it? Yes. But then let's go back. I want to create a firewall rule. 
And I want to call this the INE security class. And I wish that would just take, but it doesn't. Rule number one. And I'm going to say this is a test rule. And the network's default because that's the only network I had set up. Uh, in other words, uh, that's the one that's created automatically. Now let's talk about priority. Now priority is, of course, an integer. This integer is 0 to 65, 535. Basically, the lower this number, the higher priority. The higher this number, the lower the priority. So it's basically reverse logic when it comes to priority with firewalls, and that's pretty true among most other vendors as well. Now we could specify direction of traffic. In other words, is this going into the Google Cloud Platform or is this going out of it? Do I match the actions? Uh, in other words, does, do I allow that to uh, match or do I deny it? Targets. I have the ability to specify IP ranges, subnets. If tags were configured, I could do that. And then a specific service account. In this case here, let's say I want to configure App Engine. I could then add another filter so that, for example, I could say App Engine, but I want to make sure that the source of the traffic might be coming from a specific IP range. And I could literally specify the IP uh, range uh, in detail if I like. I could allow all traffic or I could specify specific ports and protocols. I could go ahead and specify one port or I could specify a whole range of ports, whatever I want to do. I go over here and allow all. I could also go here and basically uh, where it says, for example, here, enforcement. Determine if your rule is enforced on associated targets. Well, that's a good question. What, what is an associated target? So the enforcement is really a, a new feature. It's in beta mode still. This basically will basically allow you to specify if you want to enable or disable the enforcement and the enforcement does this basically the firewall rule will be enforced if the state is enabled or disabled when you disable the rule for example that could be useful for troubleshooting purposes or for temporary access when you disable the rule it's generally easier as well and then you could go ahead and re-enable it um, down the road so basically, you don't have to go in there and create additional firewall rules or delete them. So this is a way you can go ahead and enable or disable um, the enforcement uh, instead of um, having to go and create additional rules, for example. So you may want to disable a firewall rule for troubleshooting, for maintenance, uh, you know, especially like uh, with SSH uh, could be an issue. Uh, like with SSH, perhaps you have specific uh, SSH uh, instances that are going to specific targets and they're getting blocked and you're not sure why. So one of the easiest ways to go about it is to disable the enforcement to see if that's part of the issue, if there's some firewall rule that could be actually enforcing that. Now let's go ahead and go over here to create. Uh, actually, let me go over here. And I'm going to scroll up the screen a little bit because... I know that uh, it is hard to see probably. And then uh, down here is create. And it says that I do need to um, add my IP range, which I somehow scanned right over. And then I go, let's just double check everything. And then I go create. 
Now it is going through its process of creating that rule. This will take usually less than a minute, but it really just depends on the latency that uh, that you know may be occurring. Okay, so if we go over here, you see that we have the firewall rule that we created. It's ingress. It's for that specific target. Is for app engine service account. Protocol and ports is set to all. I just left the range open in this case. Priority is uh, the default priority. Now, again, you have the ability to create additional firewall rules or delete them. When you do that, it's fairly straightforward. Now, remember, too, that the firewall rules are going to be based on what? They're going to be based on several factors. The first to pay attention to is when you create the firewall rule, what is your VPC network? So if I go over here, I could go create another VPC network. And if I did that, I want to make sure that I create additional firewall rules for the traffic that's in that VPC network as well. Now, when it comes to firewall rules, a couple other things to point out is when it comes to targets, uh, generally you could include um, whatever you want to choose for the destination. It could be virtual machines, it could be Kubernetes clusters, app engine instances. For egress, uh, it could be you know the source VMs, clusters, instances, so on and so on. But just be aware too, when you specify a target, you want to pay attention to, um, is it just one instance? Is it by a tag? Is it by a service account? Is it all the instances in the network? A lot of things to pay attention to, um, again, when you go create uh, the firewall rule. Uh, and, and again, so just pay attention to that. Now, if I go over here to firewall rules, again, you can see I have that. If I go here, I can go ahead and create an in egress rule now. Again, it makes sense to create an ingress and egress rule for the traffic uh, that you want to specify. Now, if you do allow all, again, that's going to allow all protocols and ports to that target uh, if it's um, you know, ingress or if it's egress. Again, just pay attention to the direction of traffic. Now, action on match, I don't think I covered that, but basically this is a component that can help determine if it's going to permit or block traffic. Uh, and that could be subjected to other components of the rule. So when it's set to allow, it's going to permit connections matching other components. Deny, it's going to block those connections that match other specified components. But you can only have this to set to allow or deny. It can't be either or. Uh, I mean, it can't be both. So it has to be either one or the other. Let's continue on to the next. Now, this module here, we just want to touch on being aware of compute options. And the main part of the, the uh, goal of this course is to really focus on security. But what I want to point out is that there's a lot of security features, such as security scanner, um, that you could use on both App Engine and Compute Engine, for example. And then we have other field features like uh, shielded VMs that are available. Now, when we decide on a solution, we have the ability to determine the use case for our VMs or our compute uh, services for that matter. But most of the time, um, if you're using Compute Engine, use a security scanner to help facilitate uh, looking at known vulnerabilities. Uh, and that's true with App Engine as well. Now with Compute Engine, there's nothing really available at this time that would be similar to that, nor with Cloud Functions. But with virtual machines, for example, with Compute Engine, um, we can certainly predefine templates. We could launch from Cloud Launcher. Um, we could deploy uh, additional memory. We could deploy Linux or Windows as well. Uh, once again, uh, this course is not meant to make you um, 
uh, expert in computer storage or other services per se, sort of expecting that you already know a lot of this. But we just want to point out that some of the features around security will vary with compute options that you choose. Well, let's talk about Bastion hosts and why we may want to have one uh, for our Google Cloud environment. Now, generally, a Bastion host can sometimes be confused with a NAT server as well. And let's just talk about what's really different here. So first of all, if we want to connect with an external IP, we generally want to use a Bastion host. Now, the reason we want to do this is because in a lot of cases, we may be using like SSH or we may have um, a dispersed workforce that may be connecting to Google Cloud. And one of the best things you could do is to concentrate your connections to Google Cloud or any other cloud provider. The last thing you want to do is try to expose, um, you know, basically 100 different IPs if you don't need to. And that goes pretty much the same for leaving Google Cloud as well. So you may want to use a NAT gateway. So generally use a Bastion host for concentrating your SSH going into Google Cloud and use a NAT gateway for traversing out of Google Cloud. Now, when it comes to a Bastion host, this is going to be used, of course, for incoming access to GCP. Now, a NAT instance is going to generally provide access outside of GCP. So NAT, for those not familiar with it, is Network Address Translation. This uh, basically will discern your IP to a, a manner that essentially the same IP will be used over and over, even though you may be um, traversing 18 different points in Google Cloud to get out. Uh, and this provides some security um, features as well, because you're only disclosing one IP that is not actually the correct IP. So this is a way to use NAT, and it's a really good tool to use in most cases. So you want to essentially um, block inbound traffic as well as part of this. So once again, a Bastion host is fairly simple. Use it for your SSH concentration to get into Google Cloud. Um, it's a way, for example, to focus your developers to, to go to a jump host is another way to look at it and um, access resources to Google Cloud from that access point. Let's go ahead and move on. Okay, what I'd like to do now is do a quick little whiteboard and demo and walk you through a couple scenarios here around connecting to Google Cloud and um, doing this as securely as possible. So let's go ahead and uh, talk about our little scenario here. So right now we have our on-prem and we have our GCP um, scenario here, of course. Now what we want to do is essentially connect our on-prem services um, to Google Cloud. And, and there's a few ways to do this. So for example, if I have developers here, and I'm, I'm not going to draw it out, but let's just say if I do, um, they want to connect, they're going to connect to a VPN and we could use, for example, our own VPN or we could use Cloud VPN, which is a managed service. Now, Cloud VPN uh, is, is, of course, as we already should know, is a managed service. So we're going to go ahead and connect via Cloud VPN. Now, Cloud VPN is a gateway to gateway solution. It's going to support IKE v1 and v2. You're going to tunnel essentially. And with that said, we're going to connect with the VPN. Now, let's say we have a bunch of developers. Let's say we have 100 developers. We have a big software shop going on here. And they want to connect to Google Cloud. Now, the question is, is do we want 100 developers accessing each individual VM? Or do we want to concentrate that access to a Bastion host? And the answer is we want to concentrate our SSH connections to a Bastion host. And the reason we want to do this is, first of all, 
we want to minimize as much um, performance issues as we can with SSH. SSH just does not scale well. Second of all, from a security perspective, we want everyone to go through the same point of entry. So we don't want to have um, our, our developers, our customers, our users going directly from our VPN gateway over to the VM. We want them to go to the Bastion host as a jump, jump point or jump server, as it may be called. And that way we can concentrate everything and also log everything effectively as well for compliance purposes. Now, what about if we have our services on our VMs and our developers want to send information back to our on-prem? Well, again, we don't want to go directly to go here on the other side. We need to concentrate this to a NAT gateway. Now, a NAT gateway provides a lot of benefits. It's going to provide us, for example, um, network address translation, which is going to essentially mask our IP addresses in Google Cloud. So we don't want, uh, just in case our information is captured or there's a man in the middle, we want our, our information private. Also, it's going to concentrate our log, uh, you know, basically our log outs out of Google Cloud to our on-prem uh, in an effective manner. So basically, we don't want to um, let our developers go this way. We want them to go this way outside the VPN back over here. So the lesson learned here is we want to set up a Bastion host. We want to use NAT. Now, what about when we connect? So when we connect, there's going to be two protocols available. The first is RDP. So if we're going to use remote desktop protocol, we're using what? We're using Windows. On the other hand, if we want to connect to our Linux or Unix servers, we're going to want to use what? SSH. Now, if we're using Windows, we could also use PowerShell as well. That's another story in itself. Now, if we're using SSH, for example, our keys um, for Compute Engine will essentially be generated. So we'll have a key here where you can download the PEM file. But by default, Compute Engine is going to add those generated keys to the project or the instance. So we have a choice to decide on here. Do we use the same key for each one, or do we use different ones for each one? So generally, you want to do a project-based key, which will um, maintain the same key for every one of the VMs in that project, or we'll need to have an individual key for each of the VMs. So we have a choice here to make. We could also use what's called OS login. Now, OS login, um, is going to be a way um, that we can go ahead and generate our keys with our user account. So that way we don't need to know where our keys are. It's going to automatically be um, addressed for us. So again, a lot of things to think of here. So let's go over to the demo and talk more about this. Now I'm over here in the uh, console and let's just talk about connecting to a um, Linux uh, instance. So in this case, um, we don't have any Windows running. We have basically a GKE cluster, Kube cluster, and I have a WordPress app. Now, what I like to do is connect to the WordPress app. Uh, basically, when I select um, the SSH option here, and you can tell that it's SSH, it doesn't have RDP. So we know that this is um, what? This is basically a Linux uh, deployment. Now, what we'd like to do is connect to it. Now, when I connect to an instance, I have several choices. I could connect uh, via, basically, um, Cloud Shell, via the SDK, uh, via HTTP, whatever I, uh, whatever is appropriate, right? So generally, the console or G Cloud is, is the way to go. One of the things to be aware is that the keys, when you connect, just be aware that Compute Engine generates an SSH key pair for you and stores it in either two locations. It's either going to be basically by default, that is. So basically by default, it'll be added. Essentially, the generated key will be added to the project or the instance metadata. Or if you're configured for OS login, Compute Engine will store that key with your user account. 
Now, when we deploy keys, we have the choice to deploy a key project-wide for all the VMs, or we could deploy the key individually, as we already know. So let's go ahead and connect. So if I connect, I have the ability, first of all, let's go ahead and use a browser window. So for example, if I want to connect uh, from the browser, now I'm using WordPress, so probably 8080 should be open. And if I open that, that should bring up essentially a connection. And you can see that it's transferring the keys to the VM. So Google maintains this for you by default. On the other hand, if you want to use your own key management uh, scenario, you certainly can. So as you can see, now it's saying, um, if you're paying attention, you could drastically improve your key transfer times by migrating to OS login. So that's a choice that we have as well. And now it's saying it's not able um, to connect uh, for whatever reason, because that port may not be up. So as you can see, that's just one option. Now generally, the, the, the most effective way to connect um, is to, um, to do one of three things. So we could use our own uh, private SSH key, we go ahead and use gcloud, or we could use another SSH client. I'm just gonna go use gcloud because you could see basically how this works most effectively. So what I could do, um, if I wanted to connect, I could copy this command um, to SSH into this uh, service. So you could see SSH, it tells the zone, the site and everything. But what I could do is just run this in Cloud Shell. So I'll go ahead and maximize this so you could see this. Now, it automatically populates the command for me. So I hit enter. What's gonna happen now is it's gonna say, hey, there is no key file. What do you wanna do? Let's go ahead and generate a key. Now, I don't recommend you deploy production VMs without a key phrase. However, um, it, you know, again, if you're just deploying and testing it, it's perfectly fine. But if it's production or something really important for development, don't do that. So put in a phrase, usually the key phrase, um, you want to put in uh, something fairly lengthy, like um, I'll just put in something here, hold on. Okay, so the key file um, has been saved and you can see that it's updating the, um, the metadata as well. And you can see down here is the SHA-256 um, hash that's available. And now this will take a few seconds. So we'll go back uh, when that's done. And it actually just got done, so good. So let me go ahead and maximize this a little bit. And now um, it says uh, basically permanently added um, via, you know, basically ECDSA to the list of known hosts. So again, I'm gonna go ahead and um, enter the passphrase. So I needed to enter the passphrase. But again, you could see that um, I go up here. I didn't, um, I didn't actually set everything yet. Now, I could also go over here and type some commands. So basically, we've already entered um, um, basically the shell. And now if we wanted to SSH into it, we would then go ahead in and uh, enter the passphrase. Okay, so I entered the passphrase, and um, I'm going to try to maximize this the best I can. And you can see that um, it includes the programs and, and everything. I'm going to scroll up a little bit here, and you can see that now that I'm in the, um, the WordPress VM, it shows Bitnami, which is uh, what was deployed for WordPress. And so we've effectively SSH into um, the server with our pass key. And remember that Google maintained the certificates in this case. So that's just one way to access a client. And if it's Windows, we'd want to use RDP, and we could also use uh, PowerShell as well. All right, let's go ahead and move on. Let's talk about Google's approach to data storage security. 
Now, it's important to realize that, of course, Google has their own approach to security. So let's talk about it. Now, when Google looks at security, they have to look at their scale. They're a massive company. They've been in the data center business for two decades, just about. And everything they do, they generally, in, in a term that's commonly used, eat their own dog food. So what that means is every service that's been deployed in Google Cloud, Google essentially does the same thing and has already tried it out and know it works and are, are essentially comfortable with it. Another thing, too, is Google uses the infrastructure to build their own services. For example, Internet services like Search, Gmail, Photos, etc., G Suite, and Google Cloud as well. Now, because of this, their infrastructure is designed in what's called progressive layers. Basically, it starts at the physical security layer of the data centers, continues on to the hardware, and I'll talk about the Titan chips and everything, but basically it all really culminates to the technical constraints as well into how data is stored and how it's written. Google invests heavily into their infrastructure. There's no, no question about that. Now, Google has uh, different layers. So, for example, we're going to really talk about encryption of data and deletion of data. Now, there is a, a white paper that you want to go to called Security Design. And it, the picture of this is right here on the left. Basically, we'll focus on essentially encryption of data and deletion of data under uh, stored services. But basically, there's a lot to this white paper, so take a look at it if you haven't looked at it. It really explains well how all this works in the back end. Now, when it comes to encryption of data at rest, it uses key management. There's strict compliance to data wiping. Everything's encrypted at the application layer. Now, Google also when they look at, for example, local file storage security, um, you could use like GSUtil. There's protection modes built in as well. But basically, again, the goal is to prevent security exploits when you store data. The, en the encryption's also built into the hardware and also the SSDs. When it comes to data deletion, Basically, it's scheduled for deletion. Data is deleted in accordance to specific policies. There's also notifications when end user data, um, for example, has some handling issues or has been deleted. Now, when it comes to security, one of the things to think about is how does Google handle server security and how do they handle storage security. So like in the case of server security, they have a specific chip. It is called the Titan chip. It enables verification of the system firmware and components and essentially establishes a root identity. This is a big deal. Not a lot of other providers can support something like this. And if you want to know more, go to the blog post that goes through that more in detail. In this module here, I'd like to just briefly discuss compliance, specifically GRC and compliance component of governance and um, compliance and regulations, right? Now, once again, this is a tricky area for those folks that have worked with AWS. You're going to find that much more robust than probably what you would find with Google, but I wanted to point out um, how you would go about trying to figure out what is supported and maybe what isn't supported at this time. You go over here and filter by industry and also by regions, if you like, or you just scroll down and let's say, for example, you want to uh, spin up, you know, an environment that's going to be like an on online store. You're going to collect credit card information. You go over here to PCI DSS, and this will explain what it is. I'm sure most people are aware of what 
payment card industry uh, security standards are. But just in case you're not, it explains it. Now, here's the part you want to look at. Basically, if you want to learn how the GCP uh, platform is going to implement uh, this in your application, you want to go over here to this document here. Creating, um, basically, compliance in Google Cloud. This goes through a lot of the definitions. It talks about how Google is going to approach it, areas like that. Then you want to go back here. And then there's also, this explains um, their approach to getting compliance, and it's the 3.2 level. Then there's a matrix here that you want to look at. Now this matrix, um, you'll want to uh, pull up. And again, um, uh, let me expand my screen here. It might not come up. There it is. And there is a PDF document here. And let me go ahead and make that so that it's easily viewable or a little bit more viewable. This is the customer responsibility matrix. Now, this is specifically for PCI. And this goes through what the requirements are. And it covers the description of what GCP's responsibility is, what yours is, what the service provider is. It goes through and talks about each of the requirements and what GCP does and what the customer does. So this is pretty specific. It's pretty good to give you an idea of where you should uh, where you should start, right? So this is called the client-facing responsibility matrix, and the link for that is um, uh, is again down here. Let me go get my place back right here. The matrix. So I'm going to look at that now. If we scroll down here, you'll see that these are the services that are considered in scope. Now, in scope basically means that it supports App Engine, it supports App Engine Flexible, BigQuery, so on and so on. Now, that doesn't mean that it's going to support all of these um, applications, uh, services, for example, equally. For example, if you have a compliance requirement that's just for Europe, it may not support you in the US, for example, right? GDPR. So you have to look at those and determine what is supported and what isn't. And again, you go down, um, actually go over here. This actually links over to the additional standards uh, for PCI. Now let's just go ahead and take a look at, uh, for example, FedRAMP. Now, FedRAMP is for federal government customers. So FedRAMP uh, is supporting uh, Google Cloud and Gmail for that uh, fact as well. If we go over here, we can just go check out the marketplace. You could see that um, based, uh, based on what we're looking at, uh, G Suite and Google Cloud products and the infrastructure. So the impact level is moderate. They are authorized. They have 12 authorizations in place. So you go ahead and, um, you know, let's check out Google Cloud, for example. And let's give it a second to come up. And you can see that they are authorized. They've been through um, the readiness and the in-process, the, the approval process. You can see that the service model uh, is there. The impact is moderate. Now, if you go over here, you tell who the assessor is. That's Coal Fire Systems. They re receive the um, the approval board uh, provisional authority on, let's see, March 14th. And it just explains um, what are some of the uh, dependent products that might go with it, some of the agencies using the service. It has contact info. That's uh, Google Cloud there, for example. That is FedRAMP. Now let's go back to compliance again. And if we go over here, you could see that um, GDPR. So for our European friends, GDPR uh, is uh, uh, is going to uh, be compliant as well. Google is going to be compliant around that, of course. 
And you can look at the documentation uh, here. This is going to explain GDPR more in detail. They have a white paper and a reference guide that I found very helpful. You want to understand how um, you need to handle data, how you process data in accordance to GDPR, which is the General Data Protection Regulation. So Google does support that as well. That's about all that I had for compliance. If you have more uh, questions about compliance, you probably should go over um, to the um, compliance website here and start uh, looking more into that. Uh, if there's something not listed here, that generally means that uh, they haven't started working on the approval process or it's not fully approved. Or you may need to contact your Google representative to get additional questions answered as well. There isn't too much material on, on this, so this is what is available at the time of writing the course. Let's talk about StackDriver. Now, Google StackDriver is a hybrid monitoring solution. It supports AWS, but it has um, also um, basically other features and functions that could be very useful in troubleshooting or identifying issues in your cloud platform and can certainly um, be used actually quite well when it comes to logging uh, and monitoring, for example, with auditing. So let's go ahead and talk about StackDriver in that regard anyways. Now, StackDriver monitoring is a hybrid solution. It, it was uh, basically a company that was bought by Google, and at the time they monitored AWS and they monitored Google. And that's how that, uh, that purchase came to be. Now, what's really nice about StackDriver is that it supports multi-cloud, of course, but it's really meant to help you identify uh, issues and to fix those issues as quickly as possible. It certainly aids with cloud security and for compliance requirements. So when we look at StackDriver, it's really a portfolio of services. The newer feature actually is Profiler, which isn't there, but just be aware that Profiler could be used as well. But basically, we create a StackDriver account for a project or projects. We can monitor with a single account as well. Now, StackDriver has the ability to ingest data metrics. And then that allows you to derive value from those metrics and determine, um, for example, who access what or what kind of latency is going on. So a lot of big uh, deal around that from a security perspective. Now, uh, quickly, there's um, basically the ability to install the monitoring agent. Uh, it's recommended, if you can, to install the agent on your Compute Engine instance, just because you'll have a lot more access to custom and also extended metrics as well. With StackDriver, it uptime checks the location so you can essentially uh, be aware that uh, your services are available. There's also two uh, firewall uh, capabilities as part of StackDriver. Uh, Palo Alto is supported. There's also other monitoring solutions you could use like uh, Nagios. Uh, if you go to the cloud marketplace, there's a, a good amount of options there to consider. Now, when it comes to logging, Monitoring is one thing, but keeping track and documenting what's going on is another thing. So we want to look at essentially the ability to retain our activity, and we want to use what's called logging. Now, generally, StackDriver maintains the logs for 30 days. If you need to maintain them beyond that, make sure you dump them off to cloud storage, but also note, too, what you could also do is save them in cloud storage and then analyze them, for example, with BigQuery. So you get alerts on log events as well. So for example, if you wanna know when someone accesses a VM, it can notify you of that, or someone modifies a cloud storage object. Here's a command to install the logging agent. Now, a couple of things with, with logging. You don't generally wanna use substrings, 
Um, for example, don't try to uh, make it more complex than needed. Set up filters. So just set up, you know, basically a search for what you need. This will minimize a lot of issues. So if you want to search and analyze, export to cloud storage, and then use BigQuery to search and analyze. You could also visualize this with what's called Cloud Data Lab as well. And then if you want to create a stream um, to document this to other services, etc., use Cloud PubSub. Then we have reporting. So reporting, again, is very similar to what logging can do. But basically, the goal is to notify you of what is going on. Error notifications. It'll pop up via email. You could have PagerDuty notify you. Scripting, whatever you want to do. Then we have Stackdriver Trace. So Stackdriver Trace could also be used to analyze issues in your code, to discover bottlenecks, generate reports. Your developers are likely the ones that are going to be using this. As part of this, you'll probably want to look at latency issues. You could also look at performance issues as well. But generally, the main goal is to collect data and identify latency issues. With debugging, this is a way to inspect applications and not have to stop it. Now, one other thing on um, Stack Driver Trace is that you could visualize your data as well, and that really helps developers to identify what's going on. Now, with debugging, you take a snapshot of log points so that you go back and analyze the code. For example, if you're getting latency at a specific time, that allows you to uh, basically go back and um, really work on what's going on. So that's really about all that I had to cover um, in Stackdriver uh, as, far, as far as slides. Um, I'd encourage you to look at the Stackdriver uh, demo where we set up alerts, and we'll continue on. Now, in GCP, there's a few different types of alerts. We've got billing alerts, and you have stack driver alerts as well. Now let's talk about billing. If we go over here to billing first, you can see it tells me what I have available. Um, I can go over here and create a budget. And let's say, for example, I go look at this one here I created, uh, test. And you can see that after I reach uh, $50 at 50% or 90 or 100, I will get an alert. Now, what will also happen is, is I could go over here and create basically a project and a pub sub topic basically affiliated with that project to send notifications to if I so choose. Now, Again, you know, this gives me some flexibility on how I could have those alerts set up if I want. That's for billing. And if I want, I go create a budget. And again, it gives me this information and all that. And because I'm in my account right here, it'll go ahead and send those notifications to my account. So let's go back here to billing. And again, I have the ability to uh, to set up uh, billing uh, alerts if I so choose and create a budget, simply put. Okay, now let's talk about creating alerts for like Compute Engine or other services. So let's say I want to go create an alert and I'd like to um, create a policy that's going to alert me when I get like an HTTP uh, 402, 404 error, whatever, uh, whatever that page not found error is, right? To do that, what I want to do is I want to go and type uh, stack driver. And I could go over here to monitoring. Now I could also get the stack driver by um, going down here. And what will happen is when I select Stack Driver Monitoring, it's going to bring me over to the Stack Driver page. And you'll see that it's going to stackdriver.com. Now, because I haven't uh, used this project uh, with Stack Driver, I got to go create an account. 
on Stackdriver. Now, and this will tell you the process here, and I also have the ability to select the projects that I want to populate. I could also select that one as well. In this case, I'm just gonna select one project, click continue. This will give me um, information if I want to set up an AWS account. If I want to set up an AWS account along with my Google, I could. But what I had to do is create a new role specifically for AWS um, as well to be able to, to log into AWS and then populate information into Stackdriver. There's some permissions I have to set, a template uh, I have to create. Uh, basically around policies. Um, I'm going to skip that. And then if I want to install the agent uh, on the virtual machines, this is the uh, command to do that. This is the process. It gives you the syntax. Click continue. could also have reports sent by email. And now what I want to do is I want to start setting up my alerting policy. And so everything's been set up, and this is just telling you, you know, some things you want to look at, create a policy. So let's do that. Because I have nothing configured yet, there's no graphs, there's no incidents that are popping up. I could create an uptime check if I want, and... I could go ahead and uh, set that to a specific URL if I like. Can I cancel that for now? But what I want to do is set a policy. So let's go ahead and create a policy. When I create a policy, I have to specify conditions. This is going to basically identify if it's uh, not healthy, basically. If, it, if it's unhealthy, it's a condition, right? So it's a condition you got to set to alert you that if it if you get an HTTP error 404 page not available that's not healthy for a web application right? Then notifications this is basically how I could send text messages or cloud pub sub or emails uh, so on and so on. Uh, pager duty is a popular uh, use case as well, and then documentation that you could include. Now, the documentation you'd include could be like uh, crib sheets or um, uh, web application uh, structural documents or, or whatever. And basically, it'll be part of the notification. You could add a, a PDF or something to help your support teams figure out how to solve the problem. And then you got to name the policy. So let's go ahead and add condition first. I, I basically can, um, you, you know, create a health check if I like, create a threshold if I like, or an absence, for example, if I like as well, or, or, or rate a change. So let's just take a look at what we have first. So I could go ahead and select log metrics. I could select a specific uh, service if I like. Um, let's say, for example, here, um, I want to, let's just go ahead and select bucket. And let's say this cloud bucket, this cloud storage bucket, um, has a lot of bytes received or the count goes up, right? Let's say, for example, if it goes above, you know, five. Let's say I have more than five. And I get more than uh, five objects in less than one minute added to it, let's say. I could create a, an alert for that. And then resource could be any in this case, but I could specify that as well. And then I save the condition. Then I want to go add a notification. Now, because I have basic, I could do this either via email or through the Cloud Console mobile app. If I have the advanced Stackdriver version, I could use PagerDuty. I could text, I could use a webhook, uh, Slack as well. I'm going to go ahead and put an email. Now, I'm going to put in, you know, uh, just a email that I'm not going to really use and do that. 
and then I could add several notifications if I want. I could attach documentation if I like to. For example, I could put, you know, hello, check the PDF on the support site. You know, just, just as an example. And then I'm going to name this um, bucket change. And then I'm going to go ahead and save the policy. And that's how you would create an alert. It's fairly straightforward to do that. Um, and if for some reason there was a change, it'll go ahead and let me know. Now, what I could do is I could go back here. Let's go to cloud storage. Type in cloud storage. And you can see that I don't have um, any buckets. Let's go ahead and, uh, oh, oh, I was wondering why that didn't look right. Let's go to storage. It's easy enough to go that way. Okay, so I have two buckets there. Now, I want to go to the INE staging bucket. I don't have any files in there. I'm just going to go ahead and select a bunch of pictures. I'm going to go ahead and add those objects. And you can see that I've added 17 um, objects to that. And then what I want to do is go back to the browser. Now we could see that uh, my staging area has some files in there. Now let's go back uh, to the monitoring page. What I want to do now is let's create another alert and add a different condition. I'm going to go ahead and add a threshold. What I want to do now is let's go to a GCS bucket. So that's a cloud storage bucket. I'm going to go ahead and select that. And then what I want to do is um, let's go ahead and select uh, received bytes. And when we select that, I have, you know, above and below, I could specify a uh, threshold for one minute. Let's just put 12 in there. And let's see, I'm going to just say bucket, any, any bucket. And then what I want to do is select the project ID. And then location would be EU. That's where the bucket is. And then I want to select staging.ine. And you can see already that it is, um, oh, let's go over here. And that's uh, 39K was actually what was picked up. So that, uh, that looks pretty good. Okay, that makes sense. That's in the last hour. Let's save the condition. All right. And this is metric uh, threshold on a GCS bucket. And I'm going to save uh, the, the policy. Oop, I forgot to, to go ahead and save the policy. Let's call it GCS bucket bytes. And then save the policy. Okay, so I have two policies there. Now let's go back to storage. And let's go select this one here. Now let's go ahead and upload some more files. And I'm going to go and select, uh, let's see, some really big pictures. Let's see. Oh, probably photos of this house here. That should do it. And so it'll upload about 77 photos. These photos are going to be at least a couple megs each. And we'll go ahead and let it upload that. It's about halfway done. Let's go back to the alert and policies and go back to monitoring. Now, there's going to be a lag before you start seeing uh, basically things start to populate. But uh, eventually it will um, it'll show up. So you'll see that 69 is 77. And then if I go back here, um, and again, the policy's been set up. If I go to policies, actually, you can see that um, this is the GCS bytes. 
and it is on. Okay, good. So I go back here to policies. That's That looks good. Then I want to go back here. Now, here is what we have to do next. I want to go create a dashboard. And I call this dashboard whatever I want, but I'm going to add a chart. And I want to call this GCS. And then I want to go ahead and call this GCS bucket. And I want to say receive bytes. And if you look over here, you could see that uh, it it just uh, unless again this is brand new, so there isn't any other information. So you could see that uh, uh, in that time period we received uh, 72.1 uh, bytes per second, and then as we scroll up, there's 638 kilobytes uh, per second there. So again, it definitely is picking up uh, the uploads. So I go save now. Once again, though, this is this uh, chart will take a little time uh, to populate. So I'm going to call this my uh, INE test dashboard. And I'm just going to go ahead and let that uh, save. And, and it will populate. It's going to take uh, a little bit of time. I could go ahead and try to reload um, again. And you can see that it it did pick it up this time so you could see right there my monitoring is actually working and then the alerts will uh, come to your email as well so you'll get email alerts uh, warning you that there is an issue as well now I go ahead and add another chart and let's say I want to monitor uh, let's see CPU usage and again, it'll pick up all that as well. And I have the ability to be pretty selective. I could filter this by uh, project. I could filter this by um, the sum, by the maximum, the 50 percentile, whatever I want. Could also add more metrics, uh, for example, uh, if I like as well. But I'm going to go ahead and go ahead and save that. And you can see there that my dashboard is picking up uh, the the virtual machine instances, and the um, you can see that uh, the CPU usage is being picked up there. And that's uh, you can see that uh, again, it's it's definitely picking it up. So that's good. Okay, good. Just want to double check. So I go back here to monitoring overview. And you can see there, now I have incidents. See, this is what I was sort of waiting for. Okay. Now, you can see that the bytes picked up. In other words, it received bytes that exceeded the value of 12 bytes per second, which wasn't hard to do. And it exceeded that at 4.43 p.m. So not only that, I'll get an email, but I'll also get a dashboard alert as well. And if I wanted, uh, if I had the premium version, I could get... Uh, pager duty alerts, I could te text messages. I could also send it out to another monitoring platform if I want as well. So you have a lot of flexibility here. And you can see that the incidents have been registered. Now what I want to do here is if I go here, it tells you what's up and I could acknowledge that. And so this alert has now been acknowledged and you can see that uh, it went from red to um, to basically cleared, right? So there's three of the same alerts. And when I acknowledged it once, it cleared up all those alerts. So as you see, that's pretty good. And again, those are red as well. And that's just telling me what the incidents uh, are. You can see that I exceeded uh, the number of bytes as expected. And how satisfied am I with Stackdriver? I am very satisfied. Okay. Now, that's uh, basically how you could set up uh, alerts. It's very simple. And you do the same thing for any of the resources that are supported. 
and you can create an uptime check as well. So if I want to do that, it's very simple to do that. I could create different types of uptime checks. Um, I could, let's say, app engine, or I could select an instance. So for example, I have a WordPress application. I could call this WordPress, let's say. I could apply it to the home directory, check it every five minutes. I could uh, save it, I could test it. I'm just gonna go ahead and test it and said it responded. So I know that that's a valid URL and a valid instance that's running because it responded back. Now 30ms isn't exactly superior, but because of the fact, um, you know, this is in Europe and I'm in the US, that's actually pretty good. Let's go ahead and save that. And now that that uptime check has been created. Now, if I want, I could also create an alerting policy for that. And as you'll see, it's really the same exact steps that we just did. Okay, let's go back to monitoring. Now, you can see that I have an uptime check that's going to check um, for that application, which is WordPress. And if I go back, you can see that this just started. Um, basically here, every uh, five minutes, I think I set it to. And I could check the config, let's see, is one minute that I set it to. So every minute it'll go out and check to validate that WordPress is up. So again, Stackdriver is literally a whole day to talk about the capacity, the capabilities, the options in it. So let's go ahead and proceed on to the next module. I'm over here at the Google Cloud Platform Security webpage. And this is a page that I'd highly recommend you spend a few minutes taking a look at. And the reason is, is because there's a wealth of information that you could dive into to understand more about the Google Cloud Platform security, but also around how compliance is handled, different security products. Also, too, they go through their infrastructure on how it's built and how everything is integrated together. Compliance is covered. For those folks interested in uh, GDPR, uh, this is a facet uh, that um, may affect a lot of our European friends, and therefore, this may be a critical subject area that you'll want to look at. When it comes to uh, other facets, uh, specific uh, industries, uh, Google has developed reference architectures and other security posture uh, capacity essentially around specific industries. Uh, for example, if you go to financial services, you can see that they go through um, specific areas like high performance compute, analytics and reporting, machine language. And there's of course a lot of uh, different uh, areas that might be of interest uh, in each of these areas. So I'd encourage you to go through and just click on the links and understand, does this apply to your organization or does it not? Now, lastly, I would also point out too that there's featured resources. Some of these are videos, some of these are white papers, um, some of these are um, just references, blog posts, for example. Uh, you go over here to uh, download uh, the G Suite uh, related um, uh, resources. If you're using G Suite, there's a white paper that might be useful. Um, this one here actually is a good video. This is a GCP engineer that goes through how the GCP platform is layered and how that works to your benefit as a customer. So once again, the website is uh, cloud.google.com slash security. I encourage you to take a quick look at it and see if there's anything of interest, more or less really relegated to your specific um, enterprise vertical or specific areas of interest. Let's proceed on. Now, in this module here, I just want to talk briefly about Cloud Security Scanner. And Cloud Security Scanner is also known as App Engine Security Scanner, and there's also a version for Compute Engine as well. Now, if we go over here to App Engine, 
you could see that we have security scans. That is security scanner. And now if we go over to Compute Engine, we also have security scans as well available. Now, security scanner is going to allow you to basically run security scans for common vulnerabilities. It's a web security scanner. It's going to also scan and detect common vulnerabilities. And basically, it's going to look for you know, cross-site scripting, injection issues, content issues, any kind of outdated uh, libraries. It's going to allow you to get that early detection and allow you to deter you know, determine what, um, uh, what you can uh, essentially uh, address ahead of time before you deploy this, for example, to production. So when you could detect those vulnerabilities ahead of time, um, especially in development, it's going to allow you better production um, related experiences around your application. So it's part of that uh, capability to, to take action ahead of time during development instead of having to find a lot of these issues during uh, production. So that's uh, really at a high level what a security scanner does. Now there's um, some features as well, like if we go down here to Compute Engine, um, we can go and select Security Scanner. And the first thing I have to do before I could run it is I have to enable the API. Once the API is enabled, then I could go ahead in and create a scan. Now, part of the features of this solution is I could run vulnerability detections. I could also, um, you know, look at the results and and uh, act on those results. The outputs are pretty clear on what you want to address. Uh, you could run them using Chrome, Safari uh, as well, if you like. And um, it does support uh, Google and non-Google accounts as well if you'd like to approach it. Now, it's this is a free service, there's no cost. The only thing you got to pay attention to, to be honest, is, you know, again, depending on how far and wide your application is, you could run into bandwidth issues, additional charges for egress. Uh, again, um, you could also have a lot of APIs spinning up, so really, those are the things, but it's free to use. It's just the auxiliary services that you're using. When I go to create a scan, um, you know, I could name that scan whatever I want. I could start on a URL and uh, scan that URL. If I like, I could uh, select the type of authentication. I put in the username uh, as well. Again, I could put in, you know, an email there if I like and schedule it. Uh, as well. Then I scroll down. I could also specify the Chrome on Linux if I like, or um, Chrome on Android. And then I could also specify basically the um, you know the queries per second. And so I could do up to 20 at this particular time. Now again, you need to put in the URL. You're going to scan. This is a web-based uh, scanner, so just be aware that. Uh, um, these uh, these apps have to be hosted in Compute Engine, and you could also add additional URLs as, uh, as you like. Now, if I go back here to VM instances, you can see that I have one instance running, but I don't uh, I don't have anything that's a web-based app running, so it's not going to really help to play. But what I could do is I could go to Cloud Launcher and spin up like a LAMP stack. And again, it's fairly straightforward for you to do if you like. I go ahead and create a scan, and then you put in the URL for the WordPress application, for example, and scan that if you so choose. Now, it's going to go ahead and look for patterns. It's going to look for URLs. Um, it's going to go ahead and look for other vulnerabilities like uh, flash issues, mixed content. Again, a lot of um, 
areas to consider. So you go over here too to security scanner. The directions for that is right here. And you go ahead and um, open up the external IP page. And then you type in the VM you want to scan. You go ahead and open the security scan page, which is again sort of exactly where we're at, right? And then create a scan. Now here's what I want to show you. These are the fields. You want to pay attention to these uh, fields that you're looking at. And then you go down here, you go ahead and edit and delete your scans as you like. Now, before I run anything, one of the things I have to pay attention to is I got to make sure that the URL is hosted on Compute Engine. But also, I have to have a static IP set up. And therefore, you need to pay attention to when you're running scans, it can't be an ephemeral IP. It's got to be a static IP. So this has to be a permanent IP address that you're using, essentially. And it's not changing. That's one of the gutches. So pay attention to that as well. Now, if you did want to go ahead and play around, you go ahead and start an instance up and reserve a static IP, load an application on top, and play around with it. For this class, I'm just showing you basically at a high level what you could do with it. Let's proceed on. Let's go ahead and discuss pen testing, specifically pen testing for how you need to handle pen testing in the Google Cloud Platform. Now, for those that are familiar with AWS, you know that you need to fill out uh, basically an approval form or request form ahead of time. It doesn't work that way with Google Cloud. It's a little different. But before I talk about how you can find out more about pen testing in Google, let me just clarify what pen testing is. Pen testing is, is going to be used to, to what? To basically to gather intelligence, to look at your targets and determine, you know, what is the possible entry points? How can you break in, right? The objective of pen testing is to determine weaknesses in your cloud platform infrastructure. So to determine are there ports open on the VMs or is there a security weakness with Cloud SQL, whatever you're targeting. But you want to target the test. When you're typically target testing, right? You want to make sure, and this is true for any cloud environment, you want to target only your resources. Never go outside of your resources. It's a really good way to get attention that you don't want. So just pay attention to um, how you're testing and what, what you are testing. Now, of course, you know, you could be running different forms of pen testing, but generally, when we refer to pen testing, I'm talking about white hat, where you're trying to be the good guy, trying to figure out what what is open and what what is not. Uh, you could do blind testing, internal testing, external testing, whatever you choose. But uh, let's just talk mainly about Google and what you can and can't do. Now, this page here sort of sums it up. This is the Google Security Overview page, and it goes through... Uh, basically a lot that we talked about already. I covered the Titan chip. I talked about uh, stack security. Uh, we talked about uh, the platform itself, for example, logging data encryption. But I want to go down here to um, where it says intrusion detection. So basically, Google does intrusion detection. Uh, and basically, they use controls at data entry points, and they do use technologies to, uh, to, to remedy situations that do come up. So that's intrusion detection. But when we go down here to um, pen testing, this is what I want to just focus on. A common question I get is, you know, how do we handle pen testing? Well, Google doesn't really have any forms to fill out or anything you could do whatever you need as long as you follow the acceptable use policy and the terms of service. Basically, to sum it up, is you're going to target your cloud resources coming from your environment, your infrastructure, to Google Cloud. Now, 
you can't go outside of your cloud resources. So you have to pay attention to, to that. Now, there is also what is a, a program called Vulnerability Reward Program. So if you find that for some reason, by default, um, there is additional ports or services running that shouldn't be, and Google determines that that is a service um, that uh, probably shouldn't be open, then you could get um, a reward. So if you do find bugs, and it describes everything here, is, is it a vulnerability or a bug or some kind of uh, flaw, you know, and, and basically here's the categories, here's the rewards you could get. Sort of interesting if you do find something. So pay attention to what is called the Google um, Vulnerability Reward Program. Now, when we go back here, the acceptable use policy, you've already read it or have been prompted to read it when you signed up for using the cloud platform. Basically, you're not supposed to do this. You're not supposed to do that, right? You don't want to interfere with anyone. You don't want to do something illegal. You're not supposed to be mining cryptocurrencies, right? These are just similar, you know, common sense uh, policies that they have. And just pay attention to that. Now, when it comes to, um, you know, services, they, they want you to... Um, use them appropriately. And then the terms of service, right? Again, this goes into the deeper dive on what you can and can't do. Talks about how things are handled. And again, you need to, need to pay attention to the details. But the main factoid to get here is you don't have to fill out a form and you have to test your projects only. Once you go outside of your project, you can expect that they'll shut down your, your um, account, at least temporarily. That's been what I have been told. So don't do that. You'll be fine. So the guys that are doing the pen testing, or the gals that are doing the pen testing, need to make sure that they specify the right IP ranges, the right port, you know, configurations, ports, whatever, uh, to, to pay attention to what you're doing. You'll be okay. So there's no forms to pay attention to. I'm over here at the Google Cloud Platform white paper website. The link for this is cloud.google.com slash white papers. I encourage you to not only just look at the security related white papers, but also other white papers that may be of interest, such as deploying .NET applications, encryption in transit, encryption at rest, but also migrating to cloud storage or auditing, for example. These are areas that may be of interest to your organization. The main reason to bring you to this site is to look at the Google security white paper. This white paper covers pretty much at a high level how Google Cloud Platform is addressing areas uh, such as security mitigation, uh, mitigating issues in security, I should say. Or for that matter, how do they handle incidents? How do they handle compliance? And this goes through and explains all this related information. Uh, they go through privacy, uh, they go through auditing and compliance and different facets that might be of interest, operational security. So with that said, I encourage you to check out the white paper, go read it in detail and determine if this is useful to your situation or not. However, this will definitely give you an overview of how Google Cloud looks at security, but also not just Google Cloud, but how Google as an organization uh, handles security and looks at uh, security and, and basically posture security in a nutshell. Let's proceed on. Now I'm over here uh, in the console and I want to point out that in the console there is actually a fairly new 
um, sidebar called security. So if we click on that, it brings up essentially security features that are available. Now, some of these features um, are going to be available only if you have an organization set up, for example, with G Suite. If I go to Command Center, you can see that it's asking me to select an organization. Well, I don't have any set up, so of course, it's not going to come up. Now, there's also Identity Aware Proxy. This is actually really nice um, if you have, for example, load balancing set up, and it'll gives you that ability to manage. Um, compute engine and app engine uh, with your load balancing resources. And it essentially uses open authentication. Now, if I wanted to manage my keys, this is basically where the KMS is. This is the key management um, service. So I'd have to set this up. And when I go set it up, I have to enable the API. And then I create what's called a key ring. And a key ring is basically um, uh, nothing more than uh, basically a rotation of keys that I could use. So maybe I want to use certain keys with certain projects. And it could be global or just set to a specific region. And then I go create. But then I have to go ahead and add my keys and um, create that as well. Now I'll go ahead and maximize this. So I go ahead and go create. And I have to enter the key ring name. So I'll call that key ring one. And that should be good enough to just show you how that works. Now, that's one thing there. Now I can go over here to Context Manager, and um, I have to use an organization for that as well. And then I have Service Controls for my VPC. Now, Binary Authorization, this is an interesting one. Um, you have to enable this API. Uh, this is a way to provide policies um, for essentially your images that you're going to deploy in Kube. And so, again, that's just uh, one of uh, the possible, that's if I get back to where I want to get to. Uh, let's go back here to security. And then we have data loss prevention. Now, this is going to be useful again when you enable the API. This is the DLP API that you want to uh, enable. Your developers, of course, would um, want to, to use that. This, of course, would be used with uh, essentially cloud storage. Lastly, we have Web Security Scanner. And um, this, this is essentially um, the same as App Engine and the Compute Engine service. So that's a wrap up of the security, uh, basically, features. I'm over here at the Google Developers website called Code Labs. Now, the link for this is codelabs.developers.google.com. Now, Code Labs isn't just for Google Cloud, it's for any Google uh, supported uh, solution or product that's out there from Android to AdWords to um, Google Cloud Platform to Gmail so on and so on. With that said, let's talk about Google Cloud and why you may want to take a look at this if this is of interest. Now, when you type in Google Cloud, you'll see that it brings up uh, several, um, basically what are called code labs. Now, code labs is really for developers. However, um, some of these could be useful for anyone, whether you're a developer, an architect, or an administrator for you to just you know, get some free uh, practice around setting up, for example, uh, Google Cloud Storage, or how to deploy a Node.js application. Another one that might be useful is Cloud PubSub or Dataproc, for example. Some of these are pretty good, and it is free, and there's no cost to sign up or anything. However, you do need to have your Google Cloud uh, free tier ready to go, and basically, when you go here to select Start, what will happen is it'll tell you what you need. You'll click Next. It walks you through what you'll be doing. And it actually shows you all the steps. And when you're going through, it walks you through everything. Like I said, it's fairly straightforward. It's a good way for you to get some hands-on practice uh, that's free with some guided instructions. 
This is Code Labs. I recommend it if you haven't taken a few minutes to take a look at it. Let's move on to the final module.